I'm Eric Hyden. I'm Nick Mason. And this is Neon Static. Welcome to episode 18 of Neon Static. I'm Eric Hyden again. That's my name twice. Now you really know Good. it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Welcome you know, back, Eric, everybody. You show confidence. I think people will remember you for more than 30 seconds. I'm Eric Hyden. <laughs> I'm I, Eric record. Hyden, who is talking now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll confuse them. <laughs> oh, damn. No. <laughs> don't, don't say that. Uh, we've got a very fun episode in store for you. In fact, we've already recorded it. No, I'm kidding. We haven't. We haven't done that. We don't know. It might be boring. It's great. Uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Nick, yes. we're going to talk about uh, some stuff. We've got some news. We've got a little a smattering of news. Uh, uh, an amuse bouche of spec work, really. And then we're going to fight each other. Yeah, we're going to have an argument. Very polite for, argument for our, our main topic into the depths. We're yeah. going to talk about open slash closed deck lists in, at tournaments yes. because of reasons. Stuff that and, we'll get to, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll do a little, we'll end, end things with a little quality time. We'll talk about what we've been up to. But before we do any of that, we would like to thank our patrons whose support is helping us build a better show. And if you want to support the podcast, and YouTube channel, you can check out patreon.com slash neon static. And that's all that I will say about that. Nick. Yes. Should we go to 24-7 news cycle? We are going to Worlds. We're going to Worlds so much that like we have like tickets and stuff. Book. Extreme going. Yes. Although it just occurred to me that I have now hotel and flight tickets and I haven't bought the ticket to Worlds yet. Like the oh, one yeah, that will get me into the tournament. So I should do buy that. Buy it. Buy it. This, let this serve as your PSA, please. If you were planning to go to Worlds, they do sell out of tickets. It happened last year. Buy your ticket now. Do not procrastinate. Make it happen. Yep. I'm definitely not opening it up right as we speak. <laughs> you know what? I think it is well worth me covering a little bit of the podcast so that you can get your ticket in ordered. You go ahead and do that while we talk about the rest of the news. We're going to Worlds. We have our tickets and hotel book and all that stuff. Hotel booked. Uh, and I am on the comps team. I am pretty excited about it. I put my application in to volunteer for for helping out uh, NSG with Worlds, uh, specifically because I was interested in in doing some commentary on games and helping out with the stream after getting a taste of what it would be like to do a large event uh, and be behind the scenes on a stream for NPC Boston, and I really enjoyed it. So I just got word back a couple days ago from NSG OP, and, and I'm going to be on the comms team. So that's pretty exciting. And let's see what else. We do have uh, some Neon Static Central news. I put a video out recently announcing that we were going to do a group buy for our poker chips that we play online with, and that just closed up. I, I wanted to have a podcast episode out there, but we put the video out as a as a, sub, a substitute because I couldn't nail down this guy, Nick. Yeah, like no, talk. I've heard he's a flighty one. He is. He's uh, got a very um, stringent gaming schedule. It's and true. You gotta, you gotta get in there a couple days in advance. It is. It is true. It's like, how, what, can you describe your gaming schedule for me, uh, so I can refer to it in, 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 instead of asking you in the future? You mean like when I'm gaming with other people and all those your weekly things your stuff. weekly okay. gaming schedule? What does it look like? What's a week in Nick's gaming life like? So, all right. So I'm gonna count. I'm gonna count stuff for for this slash the the yeah. netrunner scene generally. So I would play uh, obviously with you on mo- every other Monday, or if I'm not I'm doing streaming. that, then that week is our Wednesday meetup week, which is this week, right? Um, and then Thursday nights are. Uh, 
our grand strategy game. So currently we're playing uh, Crusader Kings 3. Uh, Saturday nights I'm playing through Baldur's Gate 3 with a group. And then Tuesday nights are tentatively a thing with uh, my buddy Joe, but he is uh, very unreliable. Uh, I blame He's got a, his small child, yes. Yeah, <laughs> he's got a small chaos producer. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's funny because now like we can hear her like babbling in the background. And yep. like, yeah, kids grow up fast, it turns out, especially when like they're not your kids. They, yeah, they go quick. You just kind of blink, and it's like, wait a second, you can't talk. Oh, right, you change. You're changing no ground. That's like the whole talk. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a pretty good schedule. Anyway, sometimes we, we fit podcasts in there, too. Occasionally. So uh, a bunch of people ordered poker chips. I am slightly overwhelmed. I put a very large order into uh, chiplab.com. Uh, and so that's exciting. I'm I should be getting those in within two weeks. That's what they advertise. And I'm recording this on the first of July. So, you know, within two, two or so weeks of that, I should be getting them and then I'll be shipping them out. Nick and I are going to have a packing party and print labels and pack up chips and I'll go to the post office and drop a ton of stuff off. So that, that'll be fun. Thank you for placing your trust in me, Netrunner community for, giving me money to get you chips. I'm excited. Yeah, it's going to be good. I'm I'm excited to see these. It, it's going to be nuts. Like, just the number that you're going to be packing and sending. And yes, of course, I'll help you. But, you know. I'm expecting wild. an order of 6,350 poker chips to show up at my door. <laughs> good Lord. So, so I, I don't wow. know how they're going to ship that. Uh, yeah, on a pallet? I don't know. It's going to be expensive. That's a lot. I mean, it's free shipping. The shipping's free, so I don't know. Well, anyway. yeah. Nan PC Boston is uh, still going. Not Boston. Nan PC. Na, the North American Netrunner Player Circuit is still going on. Um, at this point, the next event is Philadelphia. That's the 13th through 14th of July, coming up pretty shortly. And then the last event in that series is San Francisco. Um, which is going to be held in July, I think. Uh, the last time I took a screen grab, it was to be announced. I imagine they might know. Can we check real quick live? Um, the That's, oh, we got all sorts of, there's like Boston stuff happening. San Francisco, 20th of July. Great. And then there's Seattle and Montreal and uh, Los Angeles after that. Oh, wow. So they've added some. That's awesome. They've added some, yeah, yeah. Seattle is the 3rd and 4th of August. Montreal is the 24th and 25th of August. I believe Andre is running that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, Los, Los Angeles has full details to come. But go check those out. Those games, those tournaments are a blast and 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 cool. I also and got our, uh, our H2 CO kit for up here in New Hampshire in the mail, and those have generally been arriving in people's hands, and they're pretty nice. I got to say that they... The door prize they included this time was, a, a, I believe, a past world's Pelongi, which is oh wow, pr- pretty nice. That's uh, sick. It's got the uh, Look How They Run, I believe is the card name, play map. Oh, yeah. Watch. Yep. Watch how yeah, they that run like 5-2 look- or whatever. It's like a 5-2 yeah, out of uh, Jinteki. See How They Run, right? I think so, yes. Yes. See How They Run is a 4-2. When you score this gen and give uh, the runner one tag, play a side game. And if the bids differ, do one core. And if the bids match, do one net damage. Yeah. I haven't seen that played a whole heck of a lot since release. People tried to do the score it end of the line in a single turn thing. Yeah. And I tried to do that too. And it's hard to do. Right. Because people generally respect, like, I don't want, they need to end their turn with four cards in hand or fewer and and then you happen then then you have it set up on the board ready to like fast advance and then hit them with a tag which is a lot of things to line up yeah yeah that's like a ton of stuff you gotta like have your hollow man sitting out there or something like something that can really just dump a ton of advancement tokens or like your i don't know big deal yeah big deal hollow man seems more more doable there yeah but 
that's not a bad thing. Uh, yeah, so that's our news. Yeah. Well, there is one other tournament to mention. The East Coast Nationals. Oh, yeah. Happening at the end of July uh, in Norton, Mass. So this is the same place that NANPC Boston uh, took place. And uh, looks like it's going to be awesome. And uh, it might come up later in our other discussions. It's the 27th and 28th. 27th to determine of and July. 28th, yes. Battleground Games and Hobbies in Norton, Mass. All right. Real quick, let's jump into spec work. So spec work is the segment where we talk about rules, interactions. We don't have anything new in this segment for this episode, but we do want to mention that last episode... Nick and I were talking about how Spin Doctor is cool, yeah. I think. <laughs> and uh, Nick mentioned that, what was the scenario? That you could potentially res a Spin Doctor after the runner broke the first two subs on a Piranha? Yes. In order to so, mess yeah, with before, the runner? Before you get to the resing, or the um, uh, resolution of the uh, things themselves, the, the subroutines... But yeah, you wait for them to break two. They think they're fine. You draw some cards so that now that third one like ends the run because you now have more cards in hand. Right. That was the idea. That doesn't no. work. No, it does not. And it's a, it's a worthwhile shout out. This got pointed out to us a couple of times uh, after we published the episode. It doesn't work because there's no res window during the encounter phase. And this is how is- I learned that there's a difference between a res window and and a paid ability window. Right. They are not yeah. the same thing. Yeah. I so if you look were. at any if you look at any of the timing charts um, that are floating around uh, GLC or if you go to, you know, uh, board game geek geek, I actually uploaded that file on BGG because it wasn't up there. And I thought it was very useful. Yeah. There there's basically like I think the only time where there is not a res window for you to res corp cards wherever it's paired generally speaking with a paid ability window except in the encounter phase uh and i don't want to misspeak there may be other places but i think that was like the sort of the one place Um, yeah which is an interesting like distinction to have you know it is and and i don't know what the intention there was exactly why but that that's the case. And it's been that way, you know, since the FFG era. So. I mean, it would prevent you from doing stuff like, um, there's a, uh, card, Isaac, uh, Liberdade, I believe in, um, the most recent set, uh, that gives ice plus two strength if it's advanced and he's in that server. So like the runner pays, some. Um, like to boost their thing can you res that after no. they've paid to boost their thing to make that their strength higher like that kind of stuff i don't that think that wouldn't it would work, work because yeah. all of the paid ability windows on one side of the table are resolved yeah all at once, all at once. so you would go yeah. you know um boost boost break break and then pass and then they would you know if there was a res window then they would res it but it would be too late yeah it's fair you can't you can't interrupt somebody and go, ha ah. <laughs> Yeah. No, no. That's Except true. For in response. Like yeah. yeah. Uh, in no, response, I, now I'm playing a different game. I'm Yeah. I'm sure there's like stuff that I'm not familiar of card pool wise, but like an upgrade or something that like adds a subroutine onto a piece of ice maybe or something like that. Like I, I'm sure there's reasons for it. And also like it feels like it would just give... The whole point is that at some point the runner has to like gain all the information they can to make a decision specifically like when breaking ice and stuff like you need to have like a set amount of information before you are asking the runner to commit to spending resources or whatever on that ice. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. It's a it's a sensible thing to uh, yeah, freeze the game state in terms of rezzed cards and be like, all right, here's what's active. That's the, all the cards are on the table. Decisions based on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Card, so. Cards on the table. Ha ha. That's all we have for spec work. Let's go into the depths. All 
All right, Into the Depths is our main segment, and this week, on our weekly podcast that we record every week. Definitely, yes. Yeah, we just don't <laughs> release most of them because they're not as they're not like up to our standards. Right, yeah, we have a high bar here. Exactly. Uh, and it's definitely not that we don't record it every week. Uh, on, on This week, on our, on our weekly, weekly podcast, the topic is going to be open and closed deck lists. And I guess Nick and I are going to present some pros and cons and we will act as representatives of each side although i can't say that i'm like fully committed to one side or the other i i'm not either so like it but yeah i don't know so it, the context of this right the idea between open and closed deck lists uh the original announced plan for uh the east coast nationals uh, which I mentioned coming up at the end of July, was to have it be open deck lists in Swiss, which is not something that is normally done in Netrunner. Uh, they will do open deck lists in the cut, but in the Swiss, deck lists are closed. And that's become kind of like a big part of how the game is played is that you will come into a tournament and like there's all these testing groups and things. They will come in with like their crazy brew that no one has seen before. Or like they're coming in with a meta call that nobody knows what meta call they're making, you know, before they play against it. And you have to, part of the game is like you've got to deduce what your opponent is doing before they do it, you know. So it's, yeah. But the proposal here was basically to change that to make it open deck lists from the Swiss so that you don't have that like need to figure out what your opponent is doing while also doing what you're doing. Like you can just read their deck list and be like, okay, this is like a punitive deck. This is going for X, Y, Z combo, that kind of thing. And I thought it was an interesting idea. Uh, NSG has since, uh, since changed the rules. Uh, so it is going to be a requisite, Closed deck list in Swiss and then open in the cut as per usual. But I wanted to talk a bit more about this because you and I talked a bit about like our, uh, we, we ended up with kind of just like a difference of opinion on yeah. whether this was a good thing or not. Right. So NSG didn't necessarily change the rules. I believe they just asked that that tournament, since it's a pr premier level tournament and this hasn't been done before, just to to do it the way that it was before and that they're open to the idea. So if anyone's interested in running a smaller tournament, like a CO or something like that, uh, with this format, with open deck lists through Swiss, then they encourage that. But just to yes. clarify. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. It was basically they had given sort of like a soft blessing to it. Like, yeah, this yeah. is okay. Let's see how it goes. And uh, then they decided, actually, no, you know what? Given the level of the event, uh, you know, it is a Nationals. It's a premier level event. We'd like you to run it in the way that these tournaments have been run. Right. There were some strong opinions voiced by the community, too, including me. Um, yes. And, yeah, and then plenty of others. Me. <laughs> and you. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. That's so where, let's yeah, talk about it. So um, we basically just sort of listed out some pros and cons of the idea. And I don't know if they will necessarily be as black and white as that. But I don't know. Do we want to start off with a, a pro? Uh, yeah. So I think like the biggest pro of open deck lists, right, is that there's not a gotcha. Um, so uh, a good example of this, uh, my game on stream, I was playing against a uh, Thule deck, the, the game from NanPC, uh, which was the first streamed round. Right. You can go watch that on our YouTube channel. Uh, Nick is the first game of game of day one. Yes. Uh, I uh, was playing against a Thule deck and I had never seen this deck before or anything like it. And my opponent installed a upgrade on R and D and I had no idea what upgrade it was. Uh, but I thought I knew, I thought it was a, uh, Managarm Skunk Works, right? They were just kind of defending R&D. The deck didn't seem to have very much ice at all. You know. Uh, turned out I was wrong. The only upgrades in the deck are, uh, is it Mr. Hendrick, I believe? Mr. Hendrick. Which is, yeah, when you access it, you either lose all your clicks or take a core damage. Uh, so 
it's rough to just blindly face check. Now, I managed to dodge it because I basically won the lottery a couple times. Um, but I was avoiding it until I had enough money, which would not have helped me if I ran into it last click. Right. So I was planning to pay five to get through it and then four to trash it or find some other way to trash it, you know, get my missed bones down, whatever it is. Um, but if I had run into that thing, like without preparing for it, without knowing what it is that it could have been, and I was just making the wrong deduction, that would have felt like kind of a lame way to lose a game. To just like run into the Hendrick and go, oh, people are playing this now, huh? Okay. Right. An open deckless tournament tests meta knowledge. Yeah. Because on some level, like it's sort of testing the player to say, how much time have you been spending playing online, playing with different groups, seeing what's being played and, and out there? That won't necessarily cover you and you'll know every single deck. Obviously, people, like you said, testing groups keep things secret. People who don't participate in the greater meta might just bring a PD snare deck to the tournament. Yeah. And just, you know, like good luck. One of something like random thing that you would never play against play around in that, that deck, but Oh, oh, you got snare. Yeah. But rip you. The idea being fewer gotchas. Is that an indisputable pro? I think it is. I don't know. Like, I, I think there is definitely a type of player who plays to get the gotcha. You know what I mean? to yeah. where when their opponent like sees a card in their hand like a lot of the fun for that type of player is to like play out some combo and have their opponent go wait what just happened or like play a card and go hang on what the heck is this who who runs this what is your deck possibly doing with this card in it uh right and if you see the deck list beforehand that's kind of gone right i mean because you're like oh okay i'm like looking at this and if you have enough knowledge of the card pool and things like that you can kind of analyze what they're doing with it uh pretty quickly i don't know that i'd be confident in my ability to do so uh but like you know it's 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 a possible thing that you can do it's going to reduce the number of games where that person gets to go all right let me show you this and, okay. you know, that's that's part of the fun for some people. So. so, exactly. I think that leads me into my first con, is that Open Decklist in Swiss, which is sort of the people's tournament time, right? That's the, that's the portion of the tournament that belongs to the, the people. Are the bourgeoisie, the fancy ones? Yes. The proletariat are the people? Exactly, yep. Yeah, yeah, I knew a thing. The proletariat's tournament. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, it can it is. I, I wrote down R.I.P. the the vibe of your sneaky sneaky trap deck, right? Like some yeah. folks come to play in the tournament to show off their creativity in deck building, and like the cool combo that no one else saw that they saw, and then they don't get rewarded for it, right? That. That, I think, is sort of the reward that those people might be seeking, maybe, some of them. Right. Is that ability to show the cool rules interaction or card stuff or like, hey, I bet you all forgot about this card. Like, one of my favorite moments from a tournament is um, we were playing, uh, what was it? It was um, was down in Boston somewhere. But anyway, somebody uh, played, uh, did a setup like they were about to... uh, deep dive and then played uh i believe the card is exploit where you just like derez three pieces of ice this was a pandemonium yeah yeah against me oh there you go all right but like this is a card i had never heard of uh nobody runs uh but it basically like derez like you know 20 something or 15 credits worth of ice and just like ended the game like it reset the 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 ice in such a way that it probably wasn't going to be regressed for multiple turns. And now the runner just has multiple turns to run wherever they want. And it was awesome. It was a really cool moment. And like the person who did it, like, like people were like crowding around the table, like, Oh, that's so cool. And like, I mean, here I am months I mean, later, I can't even remember where the tournament happened, but I can remember this play. Right. I, I was sort of making some loud noises about like, what is this card? I had never seen it before. It was, it's a quest card with the, you know, the, 
play only if you've made a successful run on R&D HQ and archives. That's people refer to those as a quest card. Mm-hmm. Um, and it says D-res up to three pieces of, of ice. And it, they're called quest cards because quest completed was the, the first one, I believe. Gotcha. And yeah, uh, it was a, it, yeah, it was like a big fun, memorable moment. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah, and those like a blowout that you never see, but like they go, Oh yeah, you're expecting this, but actually I'm going to win the game like, in a completely different way. I feel bad that I don't remember who my opponent was. I, f- I feel like it was Kevin, but I could be wrong. Uh, I apologize if I have that wrong. It was, it was quite some time ago. Yeah. I mean, but, I didn't even remember that you were playing the game. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was my Jinja city grid, uh, ag infusion deck that I was playing. That was, gotcha. a, that was a good, good game. Uh, yeah, so so the vibe of the sneak, sneaky trap deck, right? That play, basically, it, it never catches you off guard at the very least, and you probably see it coming and can counterplay. So, so the off chance, like hard to set up combo, gets even harder to set up, and so the big moment happens less. That's sort of what I think an open deck list does to some of those more fun decks. That, you know that tier one competitive decks. So they probably aren't going to win the tournament anyway. Probably, unless they were really catching people out. Yeah, and and then have some survivability into open decks deck lists, so they can do well in both. Yep, but, for sure. Yeah, but then you just they kind of never get off the ground. Right, and so this is actually something I, I know you have a uh, an ongoing disagreement with uh, Andre about this uh, the issue act deck that you've been playing a lot recently. Um, <laughs> Andre, uh, at least in his initial assessment of it, I don't know if he's gone back and reassessed it, but he was saying that basically the deck gets a lot of value out of the fact that people see Isuak and have no idea what you're doing. But if they saw the deck list and saw punitives and a bunch of five threes and stuff, they go, oh, okay, I know what this is. This was Winnegon's Isuak that went eight and oh and, and fourth at American Continentals this year. Yeah. So like that deck, like if... If, and again, I, I know you, you are of the opinion that it does not get actually a ton worse if your opponent knows what it's doing. Uh, I haven't played against enough, it, uh, enough I, of it to say, but... I think that it it does lose something. Not knowing to play around punitive counter-strike against an Isoac deck is definitely helping the Isoac player. I still think that the deck is strong once you take that away. Right. So I guess, like, in, in Andre's eyes, the only value it gets over like an RH or something like that, uh, you know, restoring humanity version of the punitive deck is that it's out of issue and thus is weird. Uh, I think you're probably right. There is more value to it than that. And, and I don't, and I am also uh, caricaturing Andre's opinion yeah. here. Uh, Andre, yeah, I was say. Andre's never going to be like, this only works because of X, Y, and Z. That's how I talk about cards. Uh, but like, <laughs> It's you like know, it's more about like the marginal value and, and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, look, look, go watch Metropole Grid. You'll learn more there than you will here. Uh, but the point is, um, like, if that like caricatured argument were to be taken as the real value of the deck, then that deck would be like trashed by open deck lists because, you know, people would know to play around the punitive and then all of a sudden, you know, it's a completely different game. Going back to pros, right? So, And I like that because it's like actually the flip side, right? You know, fewer gotchas, sure. But also like if that's the vibe of your your deck of playing the weird gotchas. Anyway, uh, I like that the idea of open deck lists would promote a less secret meta. Um, so like there's a lot of stuff in... Uh, this game about like there are small testing groups that'll brew decks on their own and they'll, you know, add like a single card and things like that. And after a tournament comes out, you will often get kind of a, a wave of new decks coming in because people know that, you know, if I put this deck out here before then, people are going to be able to practice against it. People are going to be able to tech against it, that kind of thing. Um, this you know, the open deck list doesn't do a ton for that, but it does a little bit in that you can now publish the deck like the morning you're going to the tournament. You know, call your shot. Because by then, everybody will have their deck lists in. 
uh, you know, nobody can change it. So they can't like just swap out a card real quick to tech against you. That kind of thing. Nobody's going to do that, but yes. I mean, it's possible. People definitely would. I, and I wouldn't blame them. You know, sometimes, you know, that one of Miss Bones, when you realize there's like a really good asset no. spam deck or something, is, is like correct, you know? No, no, no. Nobody would publish their deck list from a testing group on their way to the tournament. They would wait till like the last minute or after the, <laughs> afterwards. That's People fair, are, I guess. But it, yeah. like, okay. In general, that whole like idea is like baffling to me. Like uh, when when I played L5R, it was very open. Like everybody knew kind of, you know, oh, there's this type of deck, there's that type of deck. And like if there was like a secret one or like somebody was brewing something really weird and their own thing, you would see it enough online to where like, oh, yeah, no, I, I eventually know what that is probably before a tournament. There were a couple cases where like, individual deck lists came out of nowhere or something but you know it, that was often just like a lone brewer too not like a a group so i coming i think you have rose colored glasses on about that i i feel like this existed there too it just wasn't large groups that might be the case maybe maybe i'm wrong about that but in any event i would like there to be more openness and sharing and stuff in the netrunner community and this seems like it might be a way to push that might yeah. not be. But, I, at the very yeah. least, like, you can't... So I've seen tournaments where someone goes in and the tournament wasn't big enough, but people, like, played their secret deck. Yes. But yeah. it was a small tournament and there's a big one coming up, so they just don't publish the deck, even though they won a tournament with it or something like that. Right, yeah. And uh, that's like, oh, come on. <laughs> like, I want to see what did so well over here. And I don't, maybe that's just curiosity and... The desire to do better when I play competitively, but it's frustrating when someone is like, I still, everything, you don't get to know. Even though everybody at this tournament knows and scouting, probably, you know, a bunch of people have it more or less written down, but you can't, you, you don't get to know. So, so that is something that I haven't written down in my pros, but uh, is a pro that um, there is a whole thing with tournaments of scouting. Uh, oh, Eric wrote it down. Okay. I just I didn't it. read the whole list, but like, yeah, it, it is a thing to like, if you're in a testing group or you're working as a team, like to know what type of deck your opponent is playing because somebody else, or like you finish your game early. So you're able to go watch someone who you're like really, you know, uh, uh intimidated by, or you like think you might have a bad matchup into, you can like see their deck and like see some of their tech cards and what they're doing and how they're playing it like that uh is a big thing in tournaments um and the deck lists being open would mean that there that isn't like necessary you know what i mean you sit down aside from them uh, beside them and then you know like uh what what they're playing because you've just been handed their list so right it also reduces the Reduces the advantage that testing group players have over single players because testing groups effectively have a network of people surveying the room and playing games and reporting back to each other between rounds. Yeah. Whereas a single, like if you and I went to an event, there's just two of us talking to each other about what's going on. Or maybe if you're just, you know, you show up to a thing by yourself, you don't have a, a network of people feeding you information about the match you're about to play. Right. So... That levels the playing field there, which I, I like. I <laughs> Take away the power of the testing groups. Damn it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm such a grumpy curmudgeon about them. I, uh, at, like, at the same time, though, I totally understand why testing groups exists, exist like they do. I did a whole bunch of uh, tech deck building recently, and, like, yeah, like, there's a certain point at which you just go, like, okay, like, this is getting super refined. I have not just the like general idea of this deck. It's getting like down to, okay, I'm picking my tech cards and stuff. And like, you kind of don't want to reveal that to people because oh. if you do and they know it's out there, like the logic of it makes perfect sense. I just wish it weren't as big a thing as, as tightly secretive as it is. I get it too. It's just, I'm an outsider, right? For, <laughs> All these yeah. tested groups. It's a tribal thing, right? It doesn't feel good to not be a part of the cool group that has all the cool testing stuff. At the same time, 
I don't have the time to dedicate to being a part of a testing group. So even if the snare bears came up to me and said, Hey Eric, we really want you in the, in the snare bears. Uh, I would have to, <laughs> I'd be like, uh, I mean, I will be there in spirit and like look at stuff in your server and know what you're playing, but I can't contribute. Right. So I, I get it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, yeah. Testing groups. Yeah. They're yeah, cool. That's, they're that's cool, kind of a whole but they're cool. other thing. Yeah, that's a different episode. It's true. Uh, let's go with a con. I, I, it's a surprising amount more on the pro side than the con side. Uh, so one con is that, you know, this is going to add to the logistics of running a tournament um, in that you need to have everyone write their decks down or print their deck lists out and then not lose them throughout the day. It's also probably going to add a little bit of time at the beginning of matches for players to review deck lists and then during matches for people to say, hold on a second, can I see your deck list and review it and hopefully not get stuck in analysis paralysis land going, I need to think out all the possible permutations, whereas maybe before people might just play by the gut, gut feel a little bit more. Yeah. Or like not try to, you know, you're playing by what's likely, not what like the one of card. Do they have this one of card? You're like, all right, well, they probably didn't put that in the deck, you know? Right. Look at the deck list. What is the threat? Can I see your archives? You know, checking every card because you're looking at like how many are left? What are the odds? How many cards in R&D? I don't know. That's probably an extreme example. But logistics are definitely added to the tournament. And I feel like it would likely make the tournament a little bit longer, run a little bit longer. Maybe that's fine for what it adds. There is one other thing um, that it sounds small, but it isn't. Um, You're handing your deck list to another person so they can read it. uh, And they probably want to keep it next to them during the course of the game, because why wouldn't you, right? Uh, You are allowed to take notes. So theoretically, I could sit there before the game starts and copy down your entire deck list. So I I think you're allowed to have your player's deck list, your your opponent's deck list next to you during the entire game in the same sense that you can take notes. More or less, Um, yeah. So do you get it back? Like, you know, agendas are a lot easier to get back from the other person, but just not lose by accident between rounds than that. But like, I've still like stolen people's agendas or tried, you know, to just like, right. okay, yeah, or I'm taking these and leaving, you know, walk away with a, I don't know, a token or something like that. Yeah. Like it happens. Yeah. People you're getting up moving. It's busy between rounds. Yeah. I could for sure see like pretty much every tournament. I would imagine that somebody would misplace the deck list at least temporarily. Yeah, and then you're like it's sitting down, huge times, time started, and you're like, ah, oh, crap, where is it? Like, you've got to be able to present it to your opponent, you know? That's, yeah. yeah. That's the thing. It's a small logistics thing, but. I, I do think the printing and availability of the deck list would be more annoying than, like, it's more than a small thing. Like, just having, like, people bring printers and stuff like that, but I don't know if That's everybody. That's a big ask had to print stuff you know like it maybe and maybe the people bringing proxy printers is like a a rare thing in the you know new england meta i I know kevin normally does that it is absolutely a rare thing and it is a it i guess the whole thing is that it just adds logistical overhead to the tournament it's it's a fair amount of overhead that you have to you know have people you you need to provide forms for people to handwrite hopefully everybody can read their handwriting or you got to have a way to print, have a way to reprint if they, they get lost, right? It's just like, it sort of feels like one more thing. And then for a big prestigious tournament, fine. That makes sense. Um, yeah. For like a CO, I wouldn't per- personally want to run a tournament where I have to manage everybody's deck lists at the CO because we're all just there to kind of have fun. Right. And I... Have a part of me worries that if people play, they adopt this methodology that it becomes like a more and more common thing. And now all CEOs, people want this and it would be like, okay, I don't know. Maybe that's an unre- unfounded worry, but I, as a, as a tournament organizer, I kind of like the low overhead of just running the tournament, having being like, all right, there's your, there's your player, play the game, have fun. You know. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, that's, that's, a little selfish of me, I guess, but I don't know. No, but like, I think that's like a fair point. You know, it's just not, uh, yeah, it's not costless on the tournament organizers that that is like an additional ask. And I don't know the, the, so the other, the other con that I'm seeing here that I think would now come in is that like, uh, open deck lists in general are going to favor more skilled players over less skilled players in terms of win rate. Um, and I, I want to be really clear about that. Cause I, I think there's another half to this, which we'll talk about in a second, but um, like if you can look at your opponent's deck list and know like, okay, this ice costs me this much to break while it's still face down. If you're like a player who's played enough that you know exactly what the break costs are for your entire suite against everything in their deck and you know what it is, like you're going to be able to do a lot more confident running or, you know, uh, you know exactly what breakers they have. So, you know, they don't have the money right now to get into your server. So you can jam that agenda, you know, like, right. There's a lot more, uh, that you can do if you know every single card in their deck in terms of reading their possible lines, their likely lines, things like that. than if like, Hey, maybe they are running some weird thing that you've never seen before, you know, that is going to mess this all up. Right. Yeah, there, there's this meme of, um, I think it's, oh God, I can't remember. There's a, a cartoon meme where somebody hands somebody a deck list and it's like, wow, this is totally worthless. Like a new player <laughs> looking at the deck list because they don't know what, like there's there's gradients to new player, right? There's no oh, there's for like sure. brand new player. There's, there's uh, it's, it's a scale, it's a sliding scale. So if you're, one of the players who is kind of just learning the game knows the rules, but doesn't know all the cards in the card pool. You hand them a deck list. They're going to go, great. That's fun. Let's yes. play a game. And they're going to yeah. get wrecked. Whereas the, the other opponent knows every card by heart, knows the break costs and they can take full advantage of the information. Right. So, you know, and then, then at some point along that scale, the, the, the information gained on both sides evens out a little bit more, but I do think that, uh, a more skilled and well-versed player gets more out of that information than the, than, than someone who's less skilled. Yes. Yeah, for sure. The, the other part I think that you were referring to is that like, well, I what, what were you referring to? Well, so from my perspective, just, you know, as somebody coming in when I was new, like a lot of things like ways you could lose the game or things that like board States you could get into felt cheap, not in the sense of like, they just felt like, okay, well, there's nothing I can do about that. And a lot of times it was because, you know, I didn't know the card pool uh, well enough or whatever, but it was, it's also like, you know, your opponent could be running something weird that you just don't know what it is. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, they do their big wombo combo and you're dead. Um, so it's, it's like kind of a gotcha thing, kind of not, but what I would say is that if you're like a mid-level player, like somebody who knows the card pool pretty well, but maybe doesn't know every card, if you are somebody who, you know, wins games pretty regularly, knows why they lose games when they do, uh, but like, you know, isn't always making the top cut or even ever making the top cut or that kind of thing, like it, it feels to me like you would have fewer non-games. And like, this is part of the gotcha thing, but I don't know for that type of like mid-level player, it feels like the tournament could be more fun or each individual game in the tournament could be more fun than if you are trying to figure out what your opponent's doing. And it's some esoteric, weird game plan. Yeah. I like the idea of avoiding non-games. Like if you sit down and someone hands you a deck list and you see, um, Warroid trackers, Yes. You know, you know what to mulligan for. Right. You, you know, they're going to build some weird death server. Like, you know, not to just randomly run their, uh, you know, uh, loaded up clown car remote. Cause like, you're going to run into a bunch of warroid trackers. You better be ready to deal with them. Right. Yeah. So I agree. That's a, that's a good thing. I think that applies for that, that mid-level player. Yeah. Cause which I identify as. Right. Yeah. Cause like a brand new player, like if you hand me a deck list, like, you know, my 
10th game in Netrunner, I'm going to go, all right, cool. N- none of this means anything to me. I'm going to play exactly the same as if I had never seen this deck list. So like all it's doing is giving the person who has more meta knowledge, more reward. Right. And that's the thing uh, that I think is lost there. And it is a cool skill to see shown off is that when you have open deck lists in Swiss, you are no longer really testing knowledge against the entire card pool. Right. I think it's really impressive when I watch skilled players sit down and, um, you know, Andre does this on stream because he, he, you can hear him talk through his entire thought process, but anybody who's, who's doing that, like Sokka does, um, replay reviews on his YouTube channel and anybody who's doing that, you're like, okay, well, there's ice out of this deck and they're piecing this puzzle together in a very cool detective fashion where like, okay, well, they're on six credits. What am I worried about? And they're like, not systematically going through every single ice in a game that can be rezzed for six credits. They're doing an intelligent filtering of the common threats. What would likely be a problem to, to them in this moment based on what they've gathered over the, you know, across their lifetime in the game and like mostly probably the, the most recent months or so of playing. And that is a really cool and impressive skill. And you, and it's worthless <laughs> in this scenario. Yeah. Because you just need to know at a very, very small level, the card pool is confined to what's on this deck list. Suddenly there are only four types of ice that you need to worry about running into and two kinds of upgrades maybe or something. And so you can very quickly determine, you can rule out possibilities and determine correct lines of play a lot easier. And I, that's that's actually listed under the cons. That literally the sentence that I just said, I wrote under the, the pros, sorry, of the of the argument. But the loss of the... Uh, the other way of playing Netrunner is, is kind of sad. It's, I think it's a, it's a con. Yeah. To no, some degree. I, I, I would kind of agree with that. And like, so, so one of the things that I've noticed the more I play Netrunner is that the meta in Netrunner um, mimics the in-game, like the way the game itself works in that like, you know, all these secret groups will brew something up and nobody will know it. And then they'll go to a place and they'll reveal it. You know, they'll play it in some tournament and they have like that one tournament before people figure out, okay, this is what they're doing. Here's how you tech against it. This is the type of deck you bring. That's a scoring window, right? Yeah. It's just bigger, right? And even in games, when you're playing with a closed deck list, right, you walk into a tournament and you've got a closed deck list, right? The act of figuring out what your opponent's whole game plan is, like what type of deck they're running, is this a punitive deck? Is this a fast advanced deck? Is it a never advanced deck? All that kind of stuff. Like that is, you know, it's like poking at R&D, poking at HQ to see what they've got available. Like, like that metagame like feels really cool in the way that like it is yeah it, it is the netrunner game on a sli- you know the actual mechanics of the turn by turn game but on a slightly larger scale and then the tournaments and like the, the tournament seasons now with the beanstalk and everything are that on an even bigger scale where people are trying to rack up their points in a specific tournament but it's this narrow window you know and you have to keep the information secret I don't know. All that stuff is really cool. The way that like the tournaments end up being a bigger form of the same mind game, shell game stuff that you're doing in the actual game. And a lot of that is lost with open deck lists. Yeah. So, uh, also a small PSA. If you have never gone to a Netrunner tournament, um, and you're listening to to this as a kitchen table player, I really encourage you to go try it. I think that it is, very unlikely that you will have a very bad time. Yeah, agreed. Uh, especially like, I mean, people find their own level. The, the Swiss is designed to do that. You know, if you're not playing a hyper competitive deck, you will end up playing against people who are newer to the game or or other not hyper competitive decks. People who are there looking for the same thing. And after like two rounds, you're you're finding people who are pretty close to your level. Uh, you know, and you're gonna have fun. It's a fun experience. It's great. 
Also, uh, Netrunner players are part of a relatively small community, especially when you're going to like your local, a local tournament, a local CO or something. Yeah. And uh, let me tell you, you are going to make so many people's day if you are a new face showing up to a Netrunner tournament. I know when we, at our most recent CO, we had two new players who uh, I think they were going to their second tournament ever. And I hadn't seen them before and we met them and it was totally awesome just to have two new faces to be like, Hey, Oh, holy crap. All right, come on. Yeah. I, we got some door prizes for you. Like, yeah. Thank you for coming, coming out and playing this game. And, uh, I lost to one of them on round one of the tournament and I was like, okay, you got it. <laughs> no, right. no worries there. I was worried about like, you know, okay, I'm going to help you manage your triggers. And he just managed every single one of his triggers and I missed a bunch of mine and then I lost the game. So, yeah, I believe he was, um, I'm forgetting his name off the top of my head now, but, uh, he was one of the, uh, higher uh placing players at the worcester co that i went to oh really uh yes yeah so i i believe he is a uh returning netrunner player i could be wrong oh but any event cool in any event uh it was yeah no that like that kind of stuff is really yeah it's a great community and it's full of people who are just so enthusiastic about the game that like you know we want you to play we want you to have fun you know, if you come to a tournament and you sit down across from somebody and say, hey, you know, it's my first tournament. Give me some time here, uh, you know, uh, or help me out if I'm breaking some major rule or something like that. People will. And yeah, people are out to have a good time. Yeah. I guess one last uh, pro. I, I'm switching. I'm, I'm, I should be saying only cons. Uh, <laughs> well, I said, I said a con. So, yeah. Yeah. Is that it? Open deck lists would help to avoid accidental incorrect deck construction errors that you might have made because uh, at least you might catch it earlier in the tournament <laughs> yep. uh, than potentially otherwise. If you are playing a card that's not on your deck list, you're, you have two people uh, to check against. And also, when you're putting your deck list together, you're probably going to notice that there's a problem. Uh, like it's missing number of agendas or something like that. I don't know. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, nick, nick. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, this is specifically referencing that same, that Worcester CO that I went to. I was playing <laughs> the uh, sports metal deck that was played at Nan PC, which was the week before. So I was like, all right, cool. Let's, you know, go down and take that. And I, I was six cards short. So I was playing an illegal deck that actually had, and all the cards were non-agendas. So I actually had more agendas than I was supposed to. But I did all not realize- All the cards that were missing were non-agendas, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh but in sports metal, it turns out that's actually like, okay, that can be fun. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I, yeah, got to the last round and I was like, this is weird. I played this deck like three, four times. Haven't seen this one particular card, went looking for it, realized it wasn't there, freaked out, counted the deck like three times and was like, oh God, I need to be DQ'd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that would have been caught, right? You would have been writing out your deck list, probably just going card by card. Yeah. Um, yeah, missing cards are harder to catch than than cards that don't belong there. But for sure. That's uh that's why we count our count our decks at the beginning of a tournament. But end of the day, like the the overall for this, I think that they are different types of tournaments. They're going to test different skills like you said. They're going to be you know, some people's cup of tea and other people aren't going to like them. I I think that once open and closed deck lists are like tested and, and known by the community and stuff, it's going to be more like double-sided Swiss versus single-sided Swiss. And I don't know if there are still a lot of like double-sided Swiss defenders out there. I, if so, I've never met one, but like when that started up, uh, people were like against the single sided Swiss format for some reasons, which, you know, I'm sure if you played the double sided a long time, you, you know, you get attached to it. You learn the metagame. You learn about, like, the intentional draws and things like that. The math. All that is, like, fun and familiar, and it promotes a certain type of playing. You're not going to play two really, really slow decks because you've got to get through one of your games faster than the other one if you're playing one really slow deck, you know, because you've got a, a shared timer, basically. Um, so... Mm, I, yeah, it, except it, it sometimes it it did happen that way and then that really sucks. But anyway, go ahead. For sure. But like you basically what I'm saying is it's two different flavors of tournaments. Some people are going to like 
dual sided Swiss. Some people prefer single sided Swiss. They test different things. You are using different skills in terms of like time management and all that. I think open and closed deck lists could end up in a similar spot where like some people prefer a closed deck list in Swiss. Some people prefer open, but like if the other issues can be handled, the logistics and everything, it's just a different flavor of tournament. Yeah. I want to say clearly that I prefer like when Nick and I play games, I love playing open deck lists. I don't like, I don't generally like sitting down against someone and being like, all right, we're going to play this first game and we're not testing skill. We're testing who's going to get more surprised. Um, And then once we get that out of the way, then we can get to the next game where we figure out who's like going to be able to play this matchup better. Right. Uh, Which I think is what obviously the goal of the, the open sided or the open deck list is. I think it's trying to test skill uh, more clearly and say, okay, let's take away the surprises. Let's take away all that stuff. Who's a, who's a better player in this scenario or who can win the game in this scenario. Um, and I do like that kind of play, but I do feel like closing argument style here that it does change the way that the game is. It just changes the game uh, at a, at a large level to, to have none of that tested. But I don't know. The thing is that I might try this this kind of tournament out and prefer it because I'm not dying to random snares. And and that might feel pretty good. But, you know, it's change is scary and I'm scared of change. <laughs> well, and the other thing, just again, in like the closing arguments thing, I, you know, whether you are for or against open and closed deck lists, I think that you can go to a tournament that is having either one of those and have a great time. Yeah, Like it is the game itself is fun. The way that you're playing, uh, you know, between open and closed deck lists is at the margins of, you know, the actual like gameplay, the deck building, the experience playing with other people, all that stuff. All that stuff to me is more important than this stuff. But like, you know, you might have a little more fun at a closed deck list tournament because you're that type of player who really enjoys that type of you know, uh, let me show you this kind of gameplay. And you might have a little less fun at an open deck list tournament or vice versa. You know, you, you get blown out by the snare and you go, okay, well, that was a non-game that wasn't fun. All right, I guess I'm going to go sit around for 45 minutes and wait for the next round. You know, like, right? yeah, it, it's just going to depend on the person. But I, I have every confidence that like it could be done well, even if not everybody's going to love it is basically what I'm saying. It's okay not to love it. There is no right answer. There is no wrong answer. It's just different flavors. Some people are chocolate. Some people are vanilla. Other people are Rocky Road, and and we don't talk to them. List more flavors than chocolate and vanilla, please. Nope, nope, that's it. Those are the two types. Okay. I'm not not a fan of like a gender binary or any of those like kind of nonsense things. When when it comes to ice cream. Ice cream binary. (laughs) Extremely strict. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That's me. That's the moral stand I'm taking. All right. It's too bad that was the hill you decided to die on. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Neapolitan ice cream is an abomination. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, that's going to wrap up our, um, our Into the Depths segment. And to wrap things up now, let's do a little bit of quality time. And here's where I'm going to insert the quality time music that doesn't exist yet. It's quality time. I'm putting in the music for Eric. I'm going to use that. (laughs) I'm aware you're going to use it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So, Nick, what's uh, what have you been spending your time on? For fun things that it's not that runner. Uh, well, all right. Two things. Uh, number one, and I didn't write this first one down, but I've been doing a bunch of stuff over at my mom's house, like building things and doing home maintenance stuff. And turns out, guys, that's like kind of fun. It can kind of be fun. Right? Like, it's kind of like you've just finished the thing and you stand back and you go, ah, that's, that's done. That it's is fun like, when it's done. 
I don't know. Like even, yeah, that's true. It's fun when it's going well. I, I did have one where I cut, um, <laughs> we were cutting some, some, uh, baseboard and I cut the angles the wrong way. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. And I've then I there. brought it inside and I put it up against the wall and I'm like, Oh my God, you moron. So and now you're short on material because you just bought enough and that well, was the last piece. You always piece buy and... an extra 10%. Okay. You gotta, uh, yeah, you, you do. You learn that the hard way when you're doing the flooring and screw that up a bunch. <laughs> so you, by the yep. time you get to the molding, you're good. Uh, but like that part's less fun. Uh, but yeah, I don't know when it's working, when you figure out a system that that can be kind of fun. Anyway, the really fun thing that I've been doing is uh, I've been playing through Prey from 2017, which is a immersive sim, which means it's like a deus ex or dishonored where there's a whole bunch of different ways to do things. There's objects all over the world that you could interact with, most of which are useless. Uh, but it's all about kind of finding your own way to solve a whole bunch of multifaceted problems and approaching things from different situations. It's a great game. It's got a lot of like survival horror-ish elements. You're like scrounging for resources and stuff all the time, sneaking past people, that kind of thing. Uh, it, it's great. It's great. Just know that it's a survival horror. You are not supposed to, nor are you capable of killing everything in the game, which is what I tried to do. There's a specific monster that the game tells you to evade. And if you instead spend all of your bullets and all of your health packs trying to kill it and then fail and run away anyway, you're going to have a bad time because now you're out of everything. You can't do anything. And then you quit the game for several months and then come back to it later. And now it's now. Anyway. Well, uh, what's the setting? Uh, it is set on a uh, like giant space station that has been overrun by a bunch of like psychic hive mind shadow things. That can like, like the coolest thing is, is the mimics. They're these, um, little shadow things, but they can take the form of any of the normal objects. So it's like, uh, elder scrolls or something where like, there's just a bunch of like random stuff scattered around all the environments, you know, chairs and coffee cups and stuff, you know, just everywhere. And any of those could be a mimic. Nice. So, so, so they're like, is it jump scary? Sometimes it is, but like most of the time, a lot of it is more like, like most of the enemies you can hear coming. So it's Mm. more like a dread thing where like you'll enter a new zone and all of a sudden you'll hear like the heavy footfalls of like a phantom and you're like, oh crap, I don't have, I'm low on ammo. I'm low on health. I got to like hide from that thing. And you're trying to find your way towards the objective you're trying to get to without pissing it off or letting it know, or maybe you're like leading it into a trap you've built. There's a lot of like, you can place turrets and stuff and then there's lures and it's, it's yeah, there's a ton of different ways to approach all the situations. And it really makes you feel smart when like whatever you're trying actually works. Nice. It's, it sounds to me like it might play like a resident evil game or something with, uh, where you're trying to evade and you have limited ammunition and things like that, but maybe, I'm thinking about it the wrong way because I haven't played any of these. Um, would you? How did you describe it? Immersive sim is the the genre name, which the I genre? hate. But yeah, um, yeah, no, it's it's a little bit like that, except like so. There's this whole process where you can like upgrade your character and get basically superpowers. Um, so sounds reasonable. Yeah, you're like stealing them from the psychic shadow people, um, but like. At at the start of the game, it plays a lot like Resident Evil. And then by the end of the game, like right now, I can jump like three times my own height and uh, glide and uh, teleport and all this other stuff. So like like Resident Evil, one of the big things is like you, you're not that fast relative to everything else. Like I'm at the point now where I've upgraded myself to I can just run past every enemy if I want to. So nice. Yeah. No disc golf yet? Oh, I did play. Yeah, I played my second round. Uh, which uh, was fun. Yeah, I, I haven't been playing very much because I've been spending a lot of time in my mom's house doing <laughs> doing yeah. maintenance stuff. But yes. uh, when I'm not doing that, yeah, disc golf on uh, on Fridays. It's good times. Sweet. You omitted that from your gaming schedule. I think it counts. That's true. Uh, I too have been losing some fun time to construction projects. I've been rebuilding tearing down and then rebuilding the deck in my, the back uh, of my house. And we just got a new pool put in, which uh, the old one flooded out during my daughter's 
pool party last summer. So that was fun. <laughs> anyway, that's time. that's going along. I spent this entire last weekend with my dad out there um, working on it. So that's good. You know, it's good father son time. Um, besides that, though, I have been playing a bunch of games. I have gotten pretty hard into Slay the Spire. I think I might have mentioned last time. I am now, I think I'm working on an Ascension 11 run with the uh, Ironclad. And that's, it's funny because I'm not playing it like every single day like I was for a bit, but I will pick it up once every couple of days, do a run or two, and then uh, go to some of the other games that I've been distracted by. Uh, I, I started playing Fez a little bit and then most recently picked up Tunic, uh, which was, I think, a free on the PS5 uh, monthly gaming thing. So I got a hold of it that way, and I have been loving Tunic so far. It's a great combination of Zelda and Dark Souls, very clearly inspired by the Dark Souls. You ring two bells. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. That's um, like the And biggest. it's got, you know, attack, stamina, magic points, system, dodge rolling, um, you know, super clearly uh, a souls like, but it's, it's, um, similar to Fez. If, if, uh, listeners have played that game where there's like a, a secret language that you don't know how to read, I guess at some point you probably learn how to read that. Um, but you, you walk around and you like pick up your little Fox and I'm unclear on whether the Fox name is tunic or just because the Fox is wearing a tunic. I'm assuming that's probably the case which is very Link-like. It's got like a sword and a shield. You find a sword and a shield. It's a blue shield. You know, you're, you're Link, but you're a fox. In that case, it's um, almost certainly not the fox's name because Link is true. only Zelda. shows up in Legend of Zelda. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, you walk around, you find um, pages of, of like an instruction manual for the video game. It's kind of meta where it's... Wait, like... Like the instruction manual you would get as a kid when you buy like the NES cartridge or something? Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, that's Kind of sick. smattered with like Nintendo. Uh, what was the magazine called? Uh, Nintendo uh, Power, I believe. Nintendo Power. Exactly. Yeah. Sort of like smattered with some of those guides in there. And you pick up pages out of order and then they order themselves as you, you flip through them. And I guess all of the things that you need to like learn everything about the game are contained within those pages. But sometimes... They're in the, the hidden language. Um, sometimes it can require some study. A lot of times unlocking a new area involves going back behind some hidden area that you couldn't quite see, but if you rotated the camera slightly, which you can only do a little bit, you, you might have seen like the edge of a, a ladder somewhere, and then you can go up behind this thing that seemed impassable before. I really like Tunic. It's been quite a bit of fun. Nice. Um, we chatted a little bit about it on our recent stream uh, when Nick was sick and Erica and Holly came on and I started gabbing about uh, Tunic and then Holly was like pointed to her shirt and was like, yeah, I'm wearing Tunic merch, Eric. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. And then they gave me uh, a little rundown of like how it goes in the future without being spoilery. So nice. besides Video games, um, I'm playing through uh, The Feast of Hemlock Vale, which is the most recent Arkham Horror, the card game campaign that came out with Johnny. I think we've played through three f three or four scenarios. I can't recall off the top of my head. And I'm playing uh, a parallel Zoe blessed Winchester deck with um, all sorts of Olive McBride and uh, Keep Faith and Dark Prophecy and custom modifications. And Johnny is playing through a Kate Winthrop deck um, with fingerprint kit and lab assistant and, and empirical hypothesis. Uh, it came out with these customizable cards that you can upgrade the card with this little other corresponding the card that has checkboxes with abilities. And you use XP to check off checks. And then the corresponding card gets better and better and better. And Johnny's deck, at the beginning of every turn, he has to make a hypothesis. He has to say, I hypothesize that I will defeat i will um, succeed on a test by three or more or i will fail by two or more or someone else would do this other thing and if he's right he gets to charge the card to do a free card draw um so there's nice. like fun little mini games that are getting played in there like an anti kind of thing yeah yeah anti, yeah. yeah like a bet or yeah yeah that's right. neat yeah it's neat 
that's kind of the the fun stuff besides like the poker chip order took up a lot of my spare time um, yeah, organizing that and making sure I had all the payments and that I wasn't like uploading the wrong file when I hit the order button on a million chips. <laughs> so I'll that be kind of happy when those get shipped out. It was slightly stressful. I'm like not, you know, it's not huge stakes, uh, but it was multiple thousands of dollars. So it was like, you know, I hope, <laughs> I hope I don't screw this up. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was kind of fun though. I'm, I'm happy at the response. There was a lot of people who um, in their comments for the orders they placed were like, thanks for putting this together. This is so cool. So that was nice and rewarding. That's a wrap. I think for episode 18 of neon static, we've been your host, Eric and Nick. And as I said, last time, I'm going to skip through the majority of this, but if you want to get in touch with us, neon at gmail.com. I'm canister on discord. Nick is Goldbrander. And again, if you have enjoyed this, check out patreon.com slash neon static to support us. And that'd be awesome. Thanks for listening. And remember to run with your eyes closed because what you can't see can't hurt you.